Every application and service, whether on-premises or in the cloud, needs to be designed with security in mind. In previous videos, I spoke about the defense in depth model and how it helped companies protect information from those who aren't authorized to access it. We discussed how the layered approach removes reliance on any one single component and thus helps to slow down attacks whilst providing rich telemetry. Let's remind ourselves of the seven layers. It begins with the physical layer, our first line of defense in protecting computing hardware. This could include barriers, locks, and security cameras. Next, identity and access will control connections to the infrastructure. This could include services such as single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and auditing. The perimeter then protects against network-based attacks by using tools such as firewalls and DDoS protection services. As we continue down the stack, the network focuses on limiting communication between resources through segmentation and access control. The compute layer then secures access to virtual machines by ensuring that they are sufficiently patched. Next, the application layer ensures applications are stored securely and free from vulnerability. This could include update controls to underlying services such as .NET, PHP, Java, and more. Finally, the data layer controls access to business IP and customer information by following regulatory compliance. This ensures that confidentiality, integrity, and availability is maintained. Ultimately, by following these controls, we are increasing the security posture of the company, enhancing its ability to both protect and respond to security threats. Now today, I want to investigate the network and perimeter layers. I'll discuss some of the components and then jump into a demo so that we can begin to understand where the controls are applied. Let's begin with the perimeter layer, which, as you will recall, employs tooling such as firewalls and DDoS protection. Now, a firewall is simply a network device that monitors both incoming and outgoing traffic and then decides what's allowed to pass. Think of it as passport control. Information is processed and then a decision is made as to whether a crossing of the border is permitted. This information could be based on address, port, and even protocol. Services such as Azure Firewall are stateful. This means that the system looks at the complete context of a connection and not just an individual packet. What's more, packets are monitored over time and stored in a state table. This allows Azure Firewall to recognize when packets deviate from what's known and block if necessary. Now, all of this requires compute cycles to process, which means that attackers may look at ways to overwhelm the service. Fortunately, this can be mitigated through services such as Azure DDoS protection. You see, DDoS, or a distributed denial of service attack, is more common than you think. When we hear about websites being taken down, it typically means that an attacker has made it unavailable by overwhelming the service. And this could be nothing more than flooding it with traffic. By using the scale and elasticity of Microsoft's global network, we can help protect applications at the edge, identifying the attacker's attempt to overwhelm a service and mitigating further risk. And this could also save you money. Think about the elasticity of cloud services. The more you use, the more you pay. Therefore, a cleverly designed DDoS attack could cause your services to unnecessarily scale and in turn incur unintended expense. Fortunately, DDoS protection helps ensure that resource consumption reflects customer usage. If a DDoS attack is detected and resources are subsequently affected, credit will be received. So now we have a better understanding of how to control external traffic. Let's dive deeper and begin to investigate how we can protect our internal networks. Remember, at this layer, the focus is on limiting connectivity between resources so that you only allow what's needed. This in turn reduces the risk of lateral movement if an attack should occur. To achieve this, we want to use a combination of application security groups and network security groups. Application security groups, or ASGs, enable you to reuse your security policy at scale without manual maintenance of explicit IP addresses. This in turn handles the complexity of multiple rule sets and allows companies to focus on business logic. In contrast, NSGs act as an internal firewall that will enable you to filter traffic from your resources by port, address, or protocol. Let's dive into a demo. So the first thing that we will need to create is our virtual network. Now, a virtual network or VNet enables Azure resources to communicate. 
This could be internally, across the internet, or even back to on-premises resources. By default, all outbound internet traffic is permitted, and inbound access can be granted by means of a public IP address or a load balancer. I'll name my VNet production and place it in a new resource group named Virtual Networks in the UK South region. Notice that by default, Azure has assigned 65,536 private addresses from the RFC 1918 range. What this means is that none of the addresses can talk directly to the internet and they will have to go through network address translation. 65,000 addresses are more than I would ever need. So for our lab, I'm going to change this into a much smaller value. I'll set my address space to 192.168.10.0 and then set a CIDR mask of 24. What this means is that out of the 32 bits I'm going to use to create my address space, 24 of those will be used to identify my global network and 8 will be left for me to subdivide and allocate to resources. Next, I'll begin breaking up those last 8 bits into subnets. This will allow me to allocate some addresses for different purposes. I'll add a subnet named Azure Firewall subnet, a subnet named Azure Bastion subnet, another named front end servers, and finally a subnet named back end servers. I'm creating these subnets for different reasons. Some will be used today and others will be used in later videos. I'll even have some addresses spare in case I wish to create additional subnets in the future. Let's go ahead and complete our virtual network. Once created, we can navigate to the resource and understand what's been deployed. If we look under settings, we can see address space. This displays the range I previously defined and allows me to add additional address ranges if necessary. Connected devices will list the network interfaces connected via my subnets, which of course will be empty until I deploy my first resource. Subnets will list the ranges that I specified during creation and allow new subnets to be created if required. For example, Perhaps at a later stage, I'll want to connect back to my on-premises network, which will require a gateway subnet for me to do so. Next, we have DDoS protection. And for me, this option is a little confusing. You see, basic DDoS protection is integrated into the Azure platform at no additional cost. What we're seeing here is the option to enable enhanced DDoS mitigation capability. And that's a paid service that introduces adaptive tuning, attack notification, and advanced telemetry. The firewall tab allows me to add a fully managed cloud-based network security service to my subscription. This requires zero maintenance, is highly scalable, and build on a per hour rate. Security. We covered that in my last video, so for now I'm going to assume that you're comfortable with this. Moving on to DNS servers, you can see that by default, we are configured to use a DNS resource that is provided by Azure. However, notice that we can also configure a custom DNS server address, which may be required if we want to connect back to an on-premises Active Directory domain or resolve names between virtual networks. Peerings will allow me to seamlessly connect VNets across Azure's private backbone. This could be a standard peering within a region or indeed a global peering that spans regions. Next, we have service endpoints. Now, these provide a secure and direct connection to Azure services over the Azure backbone. This allows you to secure Azure resources such as storage, databases, key vaults and app services to only your virtual networks and not the public Internet. We also have private endpoints, which enable you to configure something similar, but will require you to set up a private DNS namespace. Moving on to the monitoring section, you can see that we have alerts, logs, and diagnostic settings. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the diagram feature. You see, for me, one of the coolest things about Azure is the way that it allows you to visualize your build. Now, we don't have any other resources at present. But you can see how the service is mapping out our services, and as new devices are connected, they will be populated into the diagram too. Let's move on. So the next thing that I want to build is an Application Security Group, or ASG. These will enable me to quickly configure network security rules for my resources that serve similar purposes. Typically, I will create a number of these, but for the sake of this demo, I'll create a single ASG that will be assigned to my web servers. Next, I'll create my Network Security Group, or NSG. 
Now remember, NSGs will act like internal firewalls and allow us to filter traffic to and from our Azure resources. This could be via an IP address, a port, or even a protocol. I'm gonna go ahead and create two, one for my front end servers, and then one for my back. Be aware, NSGs will be created with default rules, and these can't be removed. The important thing to remember though, are that rules are processed by priority. And that means the lower the number, the higher the priority standing. Therefore, we're going to need to create some lower number rules to override our defaults. In this instance, I'm going to create two. I'm going to create a rule that will enable inbound traffic to access my web servers on both port 80 and 443. And then another rule that would enable my home IP address, the ability to SSH into my virtual machine. Let's see how it's done. For my first inbound rule, I will specify that any source address using any port can access my web servers over TCP port 80 and 443. Notice that instead of listing each individual machine, I'm simply going to add the application security group we created previously. Next, I will add a second inbound rule that will allow SSH or port 22 over TCP for just my home IP address. Again, we want to use the principle of least privilege, so for now we will restrict it to a single address, but in future videos we'll also look at how we can use services such as just-in-time VM access to secure this further. Finally, I will associate the relevant subnets to my network security groups. Perfect. So let's now see how this works in practice by building out a new web server. I'll select a name, specify my region, and select a Linux-based operating system. I'll also opt for no infrastructure redundancy. Now, that's fine for this demo. However, in a production environment, you'd want to give this more attention. For the size, I'll enter a standard B-series VM, and then enter my username and password. Now, here's the important bit. Notice that I'm opting to turn off inbound rules. This blocks all inbound internet traffic by default. And this is because we want to work at the subnet layer and not the individual NIC. Let's move on. From the network blade, I'll add our VM to the production address space and the front end server subnet. I'll also create a new public IP address for inbound web traffic. Again, Notice that the NSG for the network interface card is disabled. This is because our front end server's VNet is already associated with a network security group. We also have the option of adding our virtual machine to a load balancing solution. This delivers high availability and network performance to our applications by balancing incoming traffic to a pool of VMs. From the management section, I will disable boot diagnostics and then select review and create. With the VM deployed, let's open the settings and navigate to networking. As you can see, the inbound port rules have been automatically added. This does, however, require one last configuration step. We need to associate the virtual machine with the application security group for the higher priority rules to take effect. To do so, I'll simply click on application security groups and configure a binding to the web server's ASG. Let's test our solution. If I open a command prompt, the first thing that I want to do is see if I can send an ICMP packet to the web server. And I can do this with a simple ping, which, as you can see, now fails. This is because ICMP is using a different protocol than what's been specified in the inbound rules of our network security group. If I create a secure shell connection, however, you can see that I'm granted access to the machine. Now, to make life simple, I've installed Docker so that I can pull down a web server container. To do so, I will run a command that will pull an image down from the Azure DAM repository and map it to port 80. Once done, if I open a new tab and point to the address of our VM, we can see that the website is displayed. So there you have it. We have created our network, specified the flow of traffic, and improved resilience from unauthorized access with a combination of NSGs and ASGs. In my next video, we'll begin to build best practice solutions that protect our server. This will include implementing backup, site recovery, and holistic monitoring solutions. Until then, stay safe and thank you.